just wanted everybody online, glad you could join us. Tua Tagovailoa, or Boyoloa. Man, I practiced that name for 20 minutes. So I got Tua Tagovailoa. He is a professional football player, quarterback for Miami Dolphins. His rookie season was 2020, and he was sought after. They had a lot of hopes for him. Uh, but he actually had kind of a mediocre debut. In fact, some point during the season, he was playing so below par, they actually benched him for a little while and didn't start. And he was interviewed recently with NBC Sports, and, and he was asked, you know, why, why, why did that happen? What's the story here? And there's a lot of different things he probably could have blamed his performance on. You know, coming out of his college career, towards the end of it, he suffered a hip injury. So that was the transition into the pros. That would have thrown a lot of people off. Uh, his, his debut season was 2020, meaning the offseason was 2019. And everything was shut down with COVID restrictions. So there were a lot of intense off-season training regimens happening. That had hit a lot of people. And he could have blamed it on these other things. But it showed a lot of character. He owned up to it. He said, honestly, in his words, I didn't know the playbook really, really good. And that's nobody else's fault but my own. And it kind of just goes to show you, if you want to play to win, you need to know what the playbook says. You can't just go off your gut and go off instinct alone. That's kind of what we're talking about this morning as we continue this series Called play to win. This is week four in this series. In the world of athletics and sports and competition, if you want to win, it takes dedication and intentionality. And in the Christian life, there's a lot of parallels there. We all have this finish line that we want to cross. We all have this victory celebration that we want to partake in. But getting to that point isn't something that just like falls into our laps. It takes intentionality and dedication if we want to play to win in this race called the faith. Today we're talking about the playbook. Just as Tua demonstrates, you can't just rely on instinct alone. You need to know what the playbook says. We, in our walk with Christ and in this Christian life, we can't just rely off of our instincts and what we think is probably best or right or whatever. We probably want to know what the playbook says if we want to play to win. That's what we're talking about today. If you have your Bibles with you, why don't you open up with me the book of Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6 is where we're going to be. If you don't have your Bibles with you, we have the screen behind us. has all of our passages. Pulled up, ready for you to engage with. We also have the FCC on the app. You can tap the Sunday button and the navigation bar at the bottom of the screen, followed by the sermon notes tool, and you'll find our passages pulled up, broken down, ready for you to engage with, follow along, take notes, get the most out of our time together. So the big question we're asking is, why is the playbook so crucial to winning the game? But before we really dive into that, we're going to ask a slightly different question and back up. What are we even talking about when we say the playbook? What are we talking about? If you've been in church for all of five minutes, you probably can probably guess the answer to that question. We're talking about the Bible this morning. you got to know what the Bible says, right? And we could probably just leave it there and move on, as sometimes we are wont to do. But honestly, we do our passage a grave disservice if we just say, read the Bible and move on. Because there's some wording and some concepts in our passage today that really help clarify for us what is the Bible, and what is our relationship with it and our approach to it? And really, it, it does a lot of work in driving those points home, hiding them in our hearts. So we're going to spend some time in this text. We're going to start in chapter 6, verse 17. Now, if you have a, a Bible with you, you probably notice that's right in the middle of a paragraph. That's usually not the best place to start reading something, because you're going to miss a lot of the context that makes it make sense. That's right. But we're just going to look at a few words in there, and you can highlight that, and in a couple of minutes we'll zoom out, back up, and we'll look at the paragraph in its entirety. So let's look at Romans chapter 6, starting in verse 17. It says this, But thanks be to God that though you used to be slaves to sin, you have come to obey from your heart the pattern of teaching that has now claimed your allegiance. Now, I appreciate a little background here before we really dive into this. The Church of Rome in the first century was a pretty diverse church, but you could still kind of divide it in half along two different camps. On the one side, you had those that were born and raised Jewish, and they were very used to the Jewish scriptures. They had been raised on those words. They were used to the Word of God and then learning how to live according to the Word of God. But on the other side, you had the Gentile portion of the church, these people that were not raised Jewish. In fact, they were all from pagan backgrounds. I mean, they grew up worshiping ancestral gods or regional gods, the big main Roman pantheon, all kinds of different gods. 
And not only was it just a matter of different belief and religion, but there was a different set of morals and ethics and a different worldview attached to that religion. So they were not really familiar with, with God's word and what it meant to, to obey it and follow his framework for life. There was maybe some parallels, but there were a lot of differences too. So if they were going to now be believers in Jesus and walk obediently before the Lord according to Scripture, there's going to be a lot of new concepts that they had to learn and get used to. You might want to think about it by way of comparison, kind of like football. If you grew up in the United States, particularly if you grew up in the Midwest, you are familiar with the game of football. We're kind of all about that here. And you probably grew up learning the rules of football and how to play football. You probably learned some of the players, and you probably know the teams and the nuances of the game. Maybe you've even gone so far, you understand kind of the finer points of running an offense and so on. There's a lot about the game you understand. But let's say, just for sake of argument, you move to Ireland. And you've got some very welcoming neighbors that invite you to come out and play football with them. Now that may be called the same thing, but it's a very different game. We call it soccer. And all of the footballs and all the, the fundamentals and the, the nuances that you picked up learning American football growing up, they're not going to be very useful for you in European football. There's going to be a lot of new things you got to learn, new experiences to pick up on. And it's kind of the same thing with this transition from paganism to Christianity. Life and worship in this old system of paganism was one thing. And though it's still called life and worship in this system of Christianity, there's, there's not a lot of connection. It's a pretty new experience. So there's a lot of new things to learn. And the, the early church recognized this, and, and they embarked on, on helping people learn these new ways and this new system of morals and ethics and so on in a process that was then and is still today called discipleship. Discipleship is this journey of learning to walk obediently with God according to his word. We make a really big deal about baptism and salvation here. That moment when you decide to put your faith in Jesus, to accept him in the waters of baptism, it's a highlight. And it was a highlight for the ancient church as well. But that wasn't where the journey stopped. That was really just the starting line. And the same is true for us today. When we say yes to Christ, we place our faith in him, we enter into his family and into his people. It's a wonderful, wonderful occasion. But it's not the end of the journey. It's the beginning. The rest of the race is called discipleship. And the early church took this process so seriously that by the second generation of Christianity, towards the close of the first century, beginning of the second century, they actually had a formal document that they had put together and used throughout the church that was called the Lord's Teaching According to the Twelve Apostles for the Nations, which really rolls off the tongue. And so, for sure, everybody just called it the Didache. Didache is a Greek word, it means teaching. It was the teaching. And it's still used by portions of the church today. You can go on Amazon and buy a copy pretty cheap, probably get one free on Kindle. It's a pretty useful resource. Now, when the Apostle Paul, in our passage, verse 17, when he says, you know, with your whole heart, follow this pattern of teaching, that's the Greek word he uses, Didache. He's not talking about this formal discipleship manual produced by the church. But to be honest with you, there's only a handful of decades between when he wrote and when the Didache was written. So there's a good idea that when we read what's in the Didache, what the early church focused on, what they emphasized, that's probably pretty close to what the Apostle Paul was mentioning and referring to when he talked about a pattern of teaching. And in that early discipleship manual, it talked about church organization. It talked about religious rites like communion, baptism by immersion. But a large portion of it focused on what it called Vices that lead to the way of death, and virtues lead to the way of life. Well, we might be tempted to look at that and say, well, it's just like moral and ethical teaching, but it was way more than that. It was the playbook for how to be on Team Jesus. It had condensed scripture into this easy-to-digest formula so that people understood this is how we play the game now. And there was an expectation from the early church that when people picked up this pattern of teaching rooted in Scripture and read it, that they would be changed by it. And that their lives would look different somehow. And so when I hear that, I hear about the Church of Rome and their expectation that they had wholeheartedly committed themselves to a pattern of teaching to change. When I hear about the early church in the second century and on, how they expected people in the Lord to be changed by these words, 
I'm kind of left asking myself the question and raising the question for us today that when we pick up the Bible, let's be honest, sometimes the question is if we pick it up. But when we pick it up, do we expect to be changed? Do we come to this playbook recognizing what it is and the power that's in it and the purpose that it has for us to change it from the inside out? I ask that question because I know how easy it is to approach the Bible with kind of a lackadaisical attitude from time to time. In fact, just last week, I was doing my morning reading, and I was you know, on my phone going through my, my reading plan, and just eating my Cheerios, eating my, my beer, and drinking coffee, you know, super strange. But I was reading this, and I read something that kind of got my mind thinking, <coughs> and that got me thinking about something else, and something else, and followed the rabbit trail. And by the time my reading had finished, and I got to the bottom of the page, I had used my time to very thoroughly plan out the rest of my day. I knew exactly how my schedule was going to look. But if you were going to ask me, what did you actually just read? I couldn't tell you. And I have a feeling I'm not alone in that. We have all probably had those moments where we hold the Word of God in our hands. We have the playbook for life and faith right in front of us with the power of change. And yet, we're just not really there. We're not with it. We're not appreciating the moment and the attention that it needs. It's easy to do, which is why we ask the question. Do we come to the Word of God, the playbook, expecting to be changed? And it's another, another reason why it's an important question is because we all have this tendency within us to do things our own way, to call our own flawed plays. I mean, we, we need a playbook that teaches how to play the game. Sometimes we just want to rely on instinct, though, kind of like you would take a boy over. Is that right that time? Right. We have this tendency, and that tendency is actually highlighted if you want to back up a little bit and read the full context of our passage this morning. Let's look at verse 15 in chapter 6. Paul asks, what then? Shall we sin because we're not under the law but under grace? By no means. So he's asking this kind of hypothetical question. He's assuming his, his audience is asking this. And the question is basically this. Now that we are in this paradigm of grace, this, this wonderful good news we call the gospel where we're not saved based on our performance. There's no punch card of good deeds we have to fill up. There's no standard that we have to earn or you know, attain. Now that we're just saved because God gives us grace through the work of Jesus, is sin still really like that big of a deal? Like, do we really have to mess with it or worry about it? Can we just keep on living the way we have been, playing the game the same old way? The question essentially is, do we have to change? And that's a question that we all kind of ask from time to time. Do we really have to change? Because truth be told, people don't like change. We will tolerate change up to a point, but if change becomes too inconvenient or asks too much, we want to dig in our heels and resist. Even if that change is good and healthy for us. Case in point, my entire life, I've had a pretty fast metabolism. I've been able to eat whatever I wanted, and I have indulged. And it's done me favors up to today. Because lately I've been looking at my bathroom mirror and things are just, they're, they're looser than they used to be. And like I do this and things move where they didn't used to move, right? Like I don't like the way that feels. And so I started thinking maybe I need to actually start paying attention to what I eat. I need to make some better choices. I need to change, right? And so this past Thursday, Colin and I went out to lunch with a couple other ministers from town. And, and I thought that morning as I got out of the shower, I'm going to get a salad for lunch. I am going to make a good decision. And then we got to the restaurant, and a salad cost more than my chicken wraps. So like, at least I'm going to get full, so I ordered the chicken wrap. And my waitress, she asked, hey, do you want fries with that? I thought, this is the time. I'm going to make a good decision. And I even said, no, I'm trying to make some healthy choices. I don't want fries today. She said, do you want ranch dressing? I said, yeah, I want ranch dressing. I want my chicken wrap. And Colin just kind of laughed at me and my hypocrisy in that moment. But it's the truth that I don't want to change. I like eating what I like. And if it's inconvenient, I don't want to do it, right? We don't like change. Unless the change is our own idea. Then we kind of like change. That's why we change our haircut. Or we change the, the colored paint on the walls. Or we, we change our address and move to a different place. If the change is our idea, we're kind of big fans of change. We like to be in control, is really what it boils down to. We like to be the ones to do what we want to do, when we want to do it, how we want to do it. And part of that is just human nature. 
it's kind of magnified in our particular culture because of our history and so on, our cultural values. We love freedom. We love independence. We love liberty. Those are all great things. But the one thing we don't value as people, both because of our cultural heritage and also just because we're people, is submission. We don't like authority over us. It's not something we crave and yearn for. We want to be autonomous. We want to be free. And that's not unique to us. It seems like this ancient group of believers kind of wrestled with that same tendency. And we can kind of read between the lines of what Paul says in verse 16 and say that, or see that. He says, don't you know then, when you offer yourselves to someone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one you obey. Whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness. The question that's being asked is, do we really have to change? And the emphatic answer is yes, because the one you obey is who you belong to. And Paul lays out this sort of binary choice, this, this very plain, this or this worldview. He says you can either choose to obey sin and belong to death, or you can choose to obey righteousness and belong to life. You can either be on Team Adam, or you can be on Team Jesus. You can be on a team that is born to lose or a team that has already won as surely as Jesus is raised back to life. Those are the choices you have. And I would be remiss if I didn't point out and emphasize there is no third choice. There is no option C where I am free to be my own. Or I don't answer to anybody. Or I am autonomous. Sometimes we read that passage about being set free from sin, and we think, Woo, yeah, I'm liberated, I'm free, yes! We don't continue reading the part that says we are not slaves to God. Freedom isn't a matter of autonomy and making my own calls and pursuing my own flawed plays. Freedom is the ability to choose who I will answer to. Will I answer to sin or will I answer to righteousness? Freedom is that choice. There's a show that was on uh, Discovery Channel for several years called Mythbusters. Probably a lot of us have seen it before. And one of the hosts of that show was a guy named Adam Savage. Adam was a very intelligent guy, not a little bit nerdy. And I was kind of a guy who's a little bit nerdy. I'm qualified to make that assessment. But he had this catchphrase that he would use from time to time. He took it from a, a British sci-fi uh, television series called Doctor Who. But he would use it from time to time, and it was kind of popular. It was put on t-shirts, it was put on mugs, bumper stickers, fans of the show loved it. I reject your reality and substitute it with my own. It was this way of acknowledging, technically, you're right, but I'm not going to change my mind. I reject your reality, I substitute it with my own. It's kind of a, a cheeky acknowledgement of my own stubbornness. But when you really think about that phrase, I reject your reality and substitute it with my own, it becomes more and more ludicrous. It doesn't matter if you reject reality. It doesn't matter if you say the sky is purple or two plus two is one. Reality is what it is. Truth is truth. Facts are facts. I can substitute my own opinions and thoughts and views and subjective assessment of reality all I want. It doesn't change how things really are. And yet that's the attitude we come with whenever we say, I don't want to answer to sin, but I also don't want to answer to God. I'm just going to trust myself and rely on my instinct. The truth is, guys, we've already done that. We did it for a long time. We played by our own flawed plays and calls, and it wound us squarely on Team Adam. Enslaved to sin, subject to death. We've already been down this road. Freedom means we get to choose. And the beauty is we actually can choose to be on Team Jesus, to walk a road of righteousness, to answer to him and to live differently. But to do that, we need to change. Because the tendency of our hearts is still to pursue our own desires. The tendency of our mind is still to view this world through the framework of how our world tells us to. The, the truth is, our relationships are so impacted by worldly tendencies that have impacted us since birth. We have sin in our lives that is deeply embedded, and the only cure is radical change. The kind of change that we find in the playbook. This word of God that has the power to teach us a better way, to transform our hearts, to renew our minds, to redeem our relationships, if we are willing to be changed by it. 
And that's really what this question, boils, what this whole message boils down to. This is the issue. Are we willing to be changed by God's word? Let's keep reading. I want to look at verse 17 again. Now we've got kind of a bigger context of where we're coming from. It says, but thanks be to God that though you used to be slaves to sin, you've come to obey from your heart the pattern of teaching that has now claimed your allegiance. There's three details I want to tease out from this verse. It really paints this beautiful picture of what scripture is and what our relationship with it is, and what it ought to be anyway. The first is the easiest to see. He says that you have come to obey from your hearts this pattern of teaching. There wasn't a single part of themselves that they withheld from the playbook and from its power to change. We have a lot of phrases very similar to this. We use them all the time. We use them in the context of athletics and competition. They didn't leave anything out on the field. They put 110% in. They, they played with all their heart and all their soul. They, they gave it all they had, right? And we all know what those mean. They didn't hold anything back. They put themselves out there and they gave it their all. That's the attitude with which this early church and these believers came to the pattern of teaching that we call scripture. And we have to ask the question of ourselves, is there anything I'm holding back? When I come to the word of God in this powerful playbook for life and transformation, is there part of my life that I'm withholding from it? Maybe it's, it's my role as a, as a man, as a husband, as a father, or my, my role as a woman, as a mother, as a wife. Maybe it's my role as, as an employee, an employer, a co-worker, a neighbor, a friend. Maybe there's a relationship in my life that I'm withholding from these teachings. Maybe it's a, a relationship that is strained by anger or frustration or hurt. Maybe it's a relationship that is shackled by unforgiveness. Am I withholding that? From the piercing and cleansing light of Scripture. My dreams and my aspirations, my goals, my views and my understanding of the world and people and how things around me work, how it ought to be versus how it is. Is there part of my life that I am sheltering from this wonderful, transforming power of God's Word? Because if there is, I'm not subjecting myself to it wholeheartedly. I'm not giving it 110%. And I'm not playing the but nobody likes criticism, even if it's constructive criticism. And so I get it. It's difficult to withhold parts of ourselves and say, well, that doesn't apply to me, or that can't mean that. But the reality is that's not a path towards freedom. It's when we open ourselves up, heart, soul, mind, strength, relationships, our understanding of the world and ourselves, and we subject it all. God, what do you have to say in your playbook? That's when we experience liberation and freedom. And slavery to righteousness and life. It's a worthwhile call to pursue this pattern of teaching wholeheartedly. That's the first detail. The second one's a little more buried. They subjected themselves to a pattern of teaching. And the Greek word from the original languages of the New Testament translated pattern, that's a good translation, by the way. But when we do a little study on that word and how it was used throughout the ancient world, it paints this really vivid picture. Maybe one of its oldest usages, its original usage, it refers to something that strikes a blow and leaves an indentation. That's the pattern, the mold, if you will. In Midwest terms, it, it's like this. If you're driving down a country road and uh, your car gets hit by a deer, it is going to strike a blow and that huge dent in the side of your truck, that is the pattern, <laughs> all right? That's the indentation. In the world of, of ancient Rome, people would write on a scroll, and then they would seal it with hot wax, and while it was still warm, they would take a, a stamp and they would press it into the wax with an insignia or something to verify who wrote it. And that, that seal, not the stamp, but the indentation, the impression left behind, that's the pattern. That's the word we're talking about. So we're not talking about something that strikes the blow. We're talking about how... Something is shaped and molded and formed to look like that thing. In this scenario, you and I, we are the wax, or we are the car, if you want to think about it in Midwest terms. We are the ones getting struck by God's word, shaping, forming, and molding around it to fit a certain pattern, not the other way around. I have never in my life heard of a deer run to the side of a vehicle 
and then mold its body around that vehicle, shaping itself in disproportionate and weird ways, leaving the vehicle unscathed. As much as we may wish that's how things played out, it's never happened. That deer strikes, and it leaves a pattern. The Word of God strikes, and it intends to leave a pattern. A wonderful, beautiful, Jesus-shaped pattern in our hearts, in our minds, in our lips, in our hands. That's the pattern of teaching to which this ancient church committed itself to wholeheartedly. Last little detail is at the end. They wholeheartedly committed themselves to this pattern of teaching that has now claimed their allegiance, is how the NIV reads it. And that's a good translation, too. It's nice and smooth, easy to read. If we were to look at it a little more literally, it doesn't be quite as smooth, but it kind of makes the point more evident. This pattern of teaching to which you have been committed, or this pattern of teaching that you have been entrusted to, which paints a really interesting picture. Because typically, we think of the Bible as something that's entrusted to us. After all, it's a book that we hold in our hands that we take care of. We open it up. We read it. We pass it on to other people. We entrust the integrity of its message to make sure that it is interpreted correctly and faithfully and true. It's something that God gave to us that we need to take care of. It's entrusted to us, right? And all that is true. But that's not what the passage says or what it means. It says the opposite. You and I have been entrusted to it. God took his people and he handed us over to this pattern of teaching. And it's the one that approves us. It's the one that shapes us. It's the one responsible for maintaining the integrity of our faith and our righteousness. In other words, we're not in the driver's seat. And we're not calling the play. That's the overall picture that gets painted here in this passage. It's this picture of people who have said, I want to be on a winning team. I want to play to win. I want to cross the finish line, and I want to taste that victory. And so I subject myself wholeheartedly to this playbook that God in his mercy has given us to change us. Because we tried it this way, and it didn't work. In fact, it was awful. And I want something more. I want life. So here I am, heart, soul, mind, strength. Shape me and teach me how to play the game. That's what it takes. We want to win. It's a mercy that God has given us in these words. So the question is, when we grab that Bible, if we grab that Bible, or when we grab it, are we coming to the playbook expecting and willing What does this look like in practice? I got to see this a little bit on Monday night. I encourage you. We were at an elders meeting. And over the last several months, the elders and I have been reviewing and revising policies. And I know what you're thinking. Yes, it is every bit as exciting as the night meeting. There is nothing we would rather be doing on Monday nights than reviewing policies. But it needs to be done. And we had sent some of them off to an attorney for legal review to make sure it was okay, worked well. And he made a note on one, it was our, our marriage policy. He said, this looks good, it's fine, but you don't have anything about uh, remarriage in there. Like there's no wording really to address it for against anything. You might want to just think about that. He said, yes, you know, let's, let's talk about that. And so around the table, the elders and I sat and talked about, what are your thoughts on this? What are your opinions on this? How do you understand this? And we had some good points and some good reflections, good discussion. And then we thought, we want to make sure everything we're saying and thinking is in line with what God has said. And so we opened up the Bible and we started reading passages. We read passages on marriage. We read passages on divorce. We read passages about remarriage. We read passages about grace. We read all kinds of things. And we started talking and discussing, well, how does our view, our view line up with what this says? Or is that what that passage means? And we went around for a good long while before we finally came to the conclusion, we need to put a lot more thought and time into this. So this month, let's read. Make sure we understand what the Bible says and how it's traditionally been interpreted throughout the centuries so that the policy, something as mundane as a policy, is in alignment with the playbook. And God, if it's important for policies to be in alignment, how much more our lives, our morals, our virtues, our aspirations, our 
hearts, our minds, our world. When we come to this playbook, it's important we ask the question, God, how do you want to change me to fit your pattern? That pattern is Christ. Because in him and only him, we do live. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your mercy. We had abandoned you to call our own plays, and yet you showed us grace. And we had run away from you, but you welcomed us home. And we had found ourselves in bondage to death, but you liberated us and brought us into life. And it cost you everything. Your own son hung on a cross and paid our debt and our burden. Through him, we have freedom and life that belongs to you. And so we praise you. And Jesus, we thank you for your faithfulness, for the pattern that you have left us to follow, to walk in, to be molded by. It's our hope and our prayers that we come to you and offer our hearts, our souls, our minds, our strength to be shaped to look like you. Help us, Father, to walk faithfully in this life and taste the blessing that comes through being on your team and your family. We pray these things in your name.